Hello, and welcome to episode 3.1, the September 13th, 2023, here we go again edition of Notes from the Isle Seat, the podcast that covers the arts in Northern Chautauqua County, sponsored by the 1891 Fredonia Opera House. My name is Tom Lachlan, and I'm your host as we bring you news and information about arts events at the Opera House and around the region, including interviews with artists and creators across the county. It's been a refreshing summer this year, with temperatures staying mild and very few days in the high 80s or 90s. I think I'm pretty lucky to live in a region where weather extremes, at least for now, are not prevalent. Apart from the Canadian wildfire smoke in June, we don't experience extremes like hurricanes or heat domes or local wildfires. I don't know that it gets any better than summers in Chautauqua County, with its abundance of festivals and regional events. As the fall begins to creep in, We'll have an abundance of leaves turning color, pumpkin spice everything, and my favorite, grape pie. There's much to be grateful for around here. So with all that in mind, let's get the third season of Notes from the Isle Seat rolling with an overview of the fall season of events at the 1891 Fredonia Opera House. Here's Rick Davis, Executive Director of the Opera House, to clue us in on all the upcoming fall events. All right, joining me now to kick off the third season of the podcast is the 1891 Fredonia Opera House's Executive Director, Mr. Rick Davis. Rick, how are you? I'm great, Tom, and thanks for doing this with me. Yo, thank you for coming on. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to, I I know this is going to sound funny, but it's hard to believe it's now three years. This is the third time we're doing this. It's going to be an annual thing now, huh? (laughs) Hooray. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. That's great. Okay. um, So let's get it, let's get it rolling. Um, We usually have you on at the beginning of each season um, here on the podcast, just to give us a preview of what's coming on at the 1891 Fredonia Opera House, hopefully get people excited with some of the events and, um, encourage people to become subscribers because of all the wonderful things you do down there so let's get the ball rolling i know we got some very uh, early live concerts and many other live concerts coming up so let's start with the concert series and see see uh see what you got coming up for us sure well we're very excited about deco ensemble and eden espinoza that you are also featuring on this episode of the podcast so i i won't go into detail about those um, other than to say that it's something we're really, really uh, looking forward to, both of them. Uh, Jacob and Sarah, as you know, are Fredonia residents, and so it's great to be able to feature some hometown talent. And uh, Eden is just, well, she's Eden Espinoza, and, and she's done just about everything on Broadway, and we're just thrilled that we're able to bring her in this fall. Uh, and one thing, I don't know if you, not having heard your interview with her, if you were able to go into much detail about the master class that she's going to be doing on campus, uh, the day of the concert in the afternoon at two o'clock. So um, that's something that's open for public observation. It's free admission if you wanted to go see uh, how she works with some of our brightest young musical theater students at the college. Yeah, I know they're going to be very thrilled to have her over there. She's, uh, you know, she's a she's a big name to really catch both for the audiences here in Fredonia at the Opera House and also for the students in the Department of Theater and Dance. And I really would recommend anybody go and listening to hear what she has to say. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so aside from the, those two, in se- both in September, um, we're really excited talking about hometown people doing a concert. Uh, Doug DeJoe, who is a Fredonia native, grew up here. Um, in he calls Fredonia the best small town in America. And uh, he left, has lived in Nashville. He's now living up in Washington near Seattle. He's coming back to give a concert. And it's something that we're really, really excited about. It. Tickets are going like hotcakes for that performance. If you don't have your tickets yet, I encourage you to call the box office or stop in or go online. Um, and he's going to have bring friends up on stage. So he's going to have a couple of other folks uh, from the community still here uh, coming up and perform with him. And Russ St. George is going to open. 
Oh, wow. For him. Okay. So, uh, we're excited about that. That's on October 13th. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm, that's going to be a great concert as part of our Folk and Fredonia, the Gilman Family Music Series. We are participating with the Fredonia Jazz Festival this year. As you know, it was not held last year. It's back. And we are going to be the venue for most of the concerts on Saturday. Um, there's an afternoon showcase featuring three or four uh, regional jazz bands. There's a headliner that's coming in who's just phenomenal, Nicole Zoraitis uh, Quartet. She's out of New York City, um, Grammy-nominated singer, pianist, songwriter. Um, she's bringing her quartet in for the headline performance Saturday evening. And Nick Weiser is bringing his sextet to open up that performance. So um, tickets are online. Um, you can go to our website and it will redirect you to a third party site that is handling ticket sales for the Jazz Festival. And there's two other days of the Jazz Festival also. Uh, Thursday night, there's a, a concert at um, Domus Fair Restaurant that's part of the normal Jazz Society series. And on Friday at the college, there is uh, an alumni jazz uh, band that's performing. And I believe that is free, free admission. So um, lots of jazz that weekend. It's October 19th, 20th, 21st. Um, and it all ends here at the Opera House on the 21st. Wow. That's, that's going to be a nice thing to bring back. I, I also see that. You know, one of our one of our regional regulars, Dave Galando, is going to be here. Dave Galando in sax time. So we got, uh, as you say, a lot of local talent coming around performing. Yeah, he, and he yeah he's one of the afternoon showcase bands, and so we're excited to have to have him here. And and there are some bands that that uh, uh, I've never heard play before. So I'm looking forward to them hearing them as part of that afternoon showcase. Okay, so um, what else you got coming up for, um, let's see, uh, live concerts? I know um, some of them are, I think the next one is the Tong Shepherd duo? Yeah, Jessica Tong, who is a uh, professor at the university, and her duo partner, Michael Shepherd, uh, she's a violinist, he's a pianist. They're going to be doing a, a recital concert um, here at the Opera House, and it's... Um, on an unusual evening, because it's on a Wednesday night, they're actually kicking off a little mini tour and they're doing, they're having their first concert here at the Opera House. So for those who uh, are interested in coming, please be aware that is on a Wednesday evening, not our usual Friday or Saturday for live events. Uh, but Jessica and Michael, uh, that phenomenal duo, we're excited to have them performing. Um, and then in, in November, that's on October 25th, right after the Jazz Festival. Right. And then in November, we end our Folk and Fredonia series with a really interesting program um, called From China to Appalachia. And it's Grammy winners Kathy Fink and Marcy Markser with Chiao Tian. And Chiao is a Chinese hammer dulcimer player. And Kathy and Marcy are, are Grammy-winning American roots music musicians. They play banjo and guitar and mandolin and the typical music, uh, the typical instruments you think of with folk music and American roots music. And they have a fascinating program that combines Chinese folk music, American roots music together. Um, they're also we're working with the college, the School of Music at the college, to have them present a workshop that afternoon um, before their concert. They're here on a Sunday. We're doing some weird concert night, <laughs> nights this, this fall, but they're here on a Sunday, again, on a tour, part of a tour, and they happen to be going by uh, the Fredonia area on Sunday, so we grab them. But they'll be doing a workshop in the afternoon uh, on campus that's open to the public, again, free admission, and then a concert uh, here at the Opera House that evening at seven o'clock. So that, that rounds out our, our uh, live on stage 
concert series. Yeah, you have it for the for the fall, but I I, I see you've also just got one in the spring, which we'll pro- we'll throw remind the people later um, uh, in May. Sparky and Rhonda Rucka coming. Yeah, so and they're part of our Folk and Fredonia music series, uh, which, by the way, is celebrating 30 years here at the Opera House in 2024. So we're going, we're celebrating that fact, and we're going back and bringing some of the the musicians and performers who appeared in the very earliest days of the Folk and Fredonia series, 30 years ago, 25 years ago. Oh, and nice. Sparky and Rhonda are, are one of those uh, groups, and we're excited that they're coming in May. Um, they're based d- down in um, the South. I, I actually forget, Mississippi or Arkansas or Alabama, one of the very Southern states. And we're excited that they're uh, coming all the way up here in May to give a concert and kind of kick off the, the, the Folk and Fredonia series. Wow, nice! For next year, yeah, yeah, they'll be fun to they'll be fun to see. And and I also know that um, the one thing that's also coming in the fall that uh, we're trying to get more people to come to because I think it's uh, very good stuff is the Ecstasis Duo has their 2.0 Young Artist recitals coming up as well. We do more live music, um, but what's unique about them is their free admission here. Um, we do put a donation box out. If you want to throw a couple bucks in, uh, that's great. Uh, but otherwise, it's free admission. And, yeah, they're going to do two concerts. The Ecstasis Duo um, student recitals. It, it, it's Eleron Avni and Natasha Farney who are the ex- Ecstasis Duo, and they've performed here at the Opera House in the past. But these are students of theirs and, and students from the School of Music, and they they... Their objective is to have the students play in a different environment other than on campus, um, different venue, different audiences, uh, to get a, a handle on not just that very safe, uh, insulated college setting, have them do performances out and about. And uh, we're thrilled that they're coming on October 26th and December 7th. Uh, to give one-hour recitals. It's usually four or five uh, students or student groups. Sometimes it's a trio. Sometimes there's quartets. I think once there was an octet. Uh, and, and then some solo uh, musicians as well. Uh, but usually four or five different offerings. It takes about an hour for the recital, and they're free uh, at 5.30 in the afternoon. So um, if you're one of those patrons that doesn't like to drive after dark or, uh, you know, you prefer something earlier in the evening, this is for you. And, and we, we hope to see many of you at their concerts. Yes, I, I, I always enjoy seeing the young talent coming across. I think sometimes that's more interesting than, uh, than a lot of other things that, that take place. But God knows we, we have a lot of it over at uh, uh, SUNY Fredonia. And speaking of free, you've been running these wonderful uh, Chautauqua County history lectures that are free and open to the public, too. And there's a couple of them coming, one in October, one in November. Yes, yes. Um, the one in October is called Gleanings from the Ellis Rowley Home uh, in Leona. It, uh, the home is no more there, but you, it, it's on, it was located on Route 60. And I'm, when you, if you go to our website, you'll see a picture of it. And I know you'll, you will remember this home. It was, um, belonged to the Ellis family. And uh, before it was uh, raised this past fall, uh, Gail Dash had an opportunity to go through it and uh, glean some artifacts and um, some documents and, and some uh, writings and uh, really interesting historical information from the home. And she's going to share that as part of her talk on October 12th. And then in November, uh, the Town of Pomfret historian Todd Langworthy is going to do a program called uh, Veterans of T- Pomfret's Past uh, because it's close to Veterans Day on Nove- the, the talk is November 9th, close to Veterans Day. He's going to celebrate um, 200 years of notable and uh, noted uh, veterans from the town of Pomfret and not just their military career, but also uh, highlights of their contributions to the community after after they serve their military. And that series is, is also free 
um, and it's their Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. Let's uh, let's wrap up. I think because I uh, I believe that you already have the entire season for the live at the Met series coming up because they just let you know what the season is and there it is and there's a, there's a lot to chew on there. But uh, let's see how much of an overview we can give uh, for people who are interested in opera. Yeah, there are. You're right. Live at the Met gives us their entire season all at once. And as part of our contract with the Metropolitan Opera, we present the entire season. Um, this year, there are nine operas, um, and they start out uh, in October. Um, on October 20, actually, the, the, the very first opera in their series that's part of their Live at the Met series is being transmitted live on October 21st. But that's the day of the Fredonia Jazz Festival, which we are already committed to. So we'll receive the Live at the Met single and record it, and we will present that opera on October 28th. And it's a new opera called Dead Man Walking. And it's based on the book uh, by Sister Helen Prejean, and and you may be familiar with the movie that was made out of it with Susan Sarandon in, in playing Sister Helen. Um, this is a contemporary opera um, of the same story. It uh, features Joyce Di Donato, who is one of today's superstar opera um, mezzos, and that will be here. We will present it on October 28th. Um, and then the second opera, which is on November 18th, um, is X, The Life and Times of Malcolm X. And it features, for people who saw uh, Fire Shut Up in My Bones here by Terrence uh, Davis, uh, I'm sorry, Terrence Blanchard. Um, the, this stars the same singer in the title role, and uh, it's part of the Mets. These two operas are part of the Mets' objective and goal to bring some younger people into opera and to experience opera and a more diverse audience as well. Um, we're thrilled that they're doing that, and we're thrilled that we're able to be present those two new operas. And then there are some of the more traditional um, operas. Uh, Madama Butterfly is part of the series. Um, uh, there's some that you've not seen or, or heard for quite some time. Florencia on El Amazonas, um, La Forza del Destino. There's several that uh, don't get a lot of play either at the Met or in regional opera companies. Um, the entire season, all nine of the operas, they're out on the uh, Opera House website, and uh, you can explore them more in depth that way. Twenty is the, dollars is the top price. Ten dollars if you're a student. It's 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 great. It's a great program. It, it, it's great. And and, and tell us uh, once again. I can't let you go, Rick, without letting talking about a little bit about uh, becoming a member. The benefits of becoming a member for the 1891 Fredonia Opera House. You know, it's very timely because we're now kicking off our 2024 membership drive. Um, we have new membership level benefits um, that are, are, uh, will, are available and explained on the um, website. Uh, but 20% of our operating budget comes from members, our members, and the contributions that they make annually. Um, and it's such an important source of revenue for us. Um, when you are a member of the Opera House, you receive discounts on uh, tickets to selected programs. You receive an invitation to the annual uh, holiday reception that's on stage in December and uh, several other benefits, many of which are new this year at different levels. Um, so I urge you to explore the membership levels on our website. Um, I encourage you to join. You can join for as little as $35, and your donation uh, helps us present programming like what we've talked about this afternoon. And uh, uh, it's, it's very important to us, and we very much appreciate all of our members. And I appreciate you, Rick, for all the stuff that you do at the Opera House, uh, for giving me this opportunity to do the podcast and all that wonderful, great stuff. So let's look forward to a great 2023-2024 uh, uh, season for the both of us. I look forward to it. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Thank you, Rick. 
You can find all the details on these events and much more on the Opera House website at www.fredopera.org. Tickets to events can always be purchased online or by calling the box office at 716-679-1891. And please be sure to consider a membership for 2023-24. Your membership contribution of as little as $35, less than a tank of gas these days, will help ensure that the Opera House will continue to bring these quality arts events to the Northern Chautauqua County region for many years to come. The saxophone is not, generally speaking, one of the instruments I associate with classical music. I tend to associate it more with jazz, but I got a real education on how the saxophone can make classical music come alive in ways I hadn't known. Jacob Swanson, one of the founders of the Deco Ensemble, gave me a few insights into the ways this instrument can make astounding music as I talked to him and Alison D'Amato about their upcoming concert. Well, I'm pleased to welcome onto the podcast a couple of members of the Deco Ensemble. Um, one of them is uh, Jacob Swanson. Jacob is one of the founding members of the ensemble, along with his partner, Sarah Marchitelli, and they founded the ensemble in 2011. The third member of the ensemble is uh, Catherine Peterson. Uh, she came along as a voice member of the ensemble in 2019. And also with me today is uh, Allison uh, D'Amato, who is uh, uh, somewhat of a... I guess she comes in and on and off and in and out and uh, uh, contributes mightily to the ensemble. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. You're Thanks. welcome. Um, so Jacob, let me start with you uh, real quickly. Give me an idea of what motivated you to start a saxophone ensemble. So Sarah and I met at SUNY Fredonia when we were undergrad students uh, in 2005, and we played in saxophone quartets and other mixed chamber ensembles and a lot of new music ensembles throughout our time at SUNY Fredonia as undergrads and then grad students. And once you leave school, a lot of your uh, connections with people tend to, you know, as people move around the country and get jobs and whatever, you're not always um, in proximity or geography with one another and able to, uh, maintain a quartet or a trio for very long or anything. But Sarah and I um, were glued together and uh, we uh, we decided to start the Deco Ensemble with sort of an, an intentionally ambiguous name, knowing that we were going to be playing together and we would be playing with whomever uh, we were, were able to work with at, the, at that time. So, you know, throughout our more than 10 years of Deco Ensembling, we played quartet concerts, uh, concerti with uh, orchestras, uh, worked with poets and dance companies and uh, other saxophonists and uh, cellists and wonderful pianists and vocalists, and it's en enriched our lives mightily. So Deco has always been a saxophone-centric ensemble, um, but, uh, but we've been appreciative to all of our many collaborators along, along well the way. you know i mean it's uh you they're just like the three of you it's very hard to keep an ensemble together with just two instruments but i have to say um listening to some of your music that you have on youtube i was completely fascinated by the fact that you could actually um put together you know a piece with just two saxophones that that was kind of interesting <laughs> thank you we've been uh the uh, uh, beneficiaries of some wonderfully talented composers and uh, and and some some good 
music we stole along the way as well. That's, oh, oh, everybody. Yeah, all, all good artists steal, Jacob. So don't be yeah. ashamed of that. <laughs> Allison, you've joined them as a pianist. Um, and I did hear, now that I think about it, I did hear some of your work. Um, you put out a series of um, YouTube videos during the uh, pandemic. And I think I heard some of your work on sure. the pandemic. So um, how do you fit in every once in a while? Do you uh, play when needed? Are you going to Are you going to be playing for the concert on the 15th of September? Yes, definitely. We'll, I'll be part of that. And... Allison will be playing the most on that concert. <laughs> the most notes, using uh, both hands. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, the great thing is, I mean, I am a pianist. I'm on the faculty at Eastman School of Music, and I also collaborate a lot in the Fredonia area with, with a lot of the faculty here. And the great thing that happened just a little while before the pandemic happened uh, was that Jake and Sarah moved next door. Oh, and yeah. they're just, it just seemed this obvious thing, especially when we were all kind of, you know, sheltering in place that we could just play mm. music together right there without having to go mm -hmm. anywhere. I, yeah, I, I can't uh, overstate the, the, the warmth and gratitude we have for like our community that we're a part of and, you know, our wonderful next door neighbors, uh, Lynn and Allison and, um, and, and, you know, the, like, yeah, the community that we've been fortunate to find ourselves to have stumbled into. Yeah, and it's pretty special. And the, the thing also, and, and I'm going to put a plug, another plug in for Deco too, is that the great thing about them is that, Yes, it's saxophone centric, but it's really about collaboration. Mm -hmm. They value collaboration. Jake and Sarah themselves, obviously, they're married and, and they're together, but they are fantastic players together. There's just a great symbiotic relationship. And as a collaborative pianist, I really value that focus and it's a great joy to just jump into such a unified musical ensemble. Yes, you know, I noticed that in their in their um, um, work. I mean, I, I actually loved those um, pandemic videos. They were great, but the th nice thing about them was the fact that you could really look close and see the two of them just looking at each other. You could watch the body language. You could see them kind mm -hmm. of, you know, I don't know what the secret uh, body messages are, like you know, here's a cutoff, and we, you know, the, the, but but it really yeah. did look locked in. I have to say you're right about that, Allison. Yeah, it's a great thing. Yeah, it's it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And uh, I also uh, give a shout out to Lynn McMurtry, who uh, I heard uh, perform on one of those too as well. Um, just wonderful. Uh, those uh, so Lynn and um, some of those. Uh, from home concerts were for our our Bach the Vote uh, <laughs> mini series that we ran on uh, on the on on YouTube because uh, you know famously there's the Rock yes. the Vote movement and so we just went as nerdy as we could with it to Bach the Vote <laughs> and um, and we had, and again yeah playing with uh, Lynn and Allison was really yeah it was really a lot of it was really interesting to just watch those videos and get a sense of the whole thing. So um, can you give us, uh, uh, Jacob, Allison, can you give us a sense of um, uh, what your program's going to be on uh, the 15th? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So our program um, is really meant to be fun end of summer celebration of we're releasing our first uh, studio recording as a as, as an ensemble. And we will be representing pieces that are on that recording um, but it's, it's a lot of our favorite musics to play together. Uh, and I did intentionally plural that, but like, um, but the, we'll, we'll be playing the Brahms horn trio, uh, the, uh, Alice and Sarah and I for on soprano tenor and, uh, piano, as opposed to violin, uh, horn and piano, some music that we've lifted from Piazzolla, uh, from Vivaldi. And a new piece by uh, Rob McClure, who's a comp faculty at Ohio University in Athens. Uh, we had a residency as an ensemble out there uh, this past February. There, his music's represented on, on the recording release. And then Catherine um, is going to be doing a set with Allison, if you'd like to talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. One thing that I want to also mention um, that Jake sort of alluded to is that he is a bit of a master transcriber. 
as he steals from other <laughs> repertoire. Uh, this Brahms uh, horn trio is one of the great chamber pieces in the repertoire. It's also fiendishly hard um, for everybody involved, really. Yeah. Um, he has to play up in the highest violin range, and and there's you know a great piano part. But uh, it we've performed it a number of times, and it's really just a, a, such a meaty, great piece. Yeah. Um, and Catherine, I'm really thrilled to see she's bringing some songs in um, by almost all African American composers um, that are just, you know, we're in this kind of time where the the voice repertoire is just exploding. Well, repertoire in general, I think, is exploding. And she's absolutely right in there with with championing some of these really lyric and fabulous um settings of of poems by these composers that i know will be more well known as we keep going um I, one of them is uh Rosephine powell who's still living and she's a university voice professor in um alabama and robert owens who is a favorite discovery of mine who's set poetry from all over the German literature as well as American Langston Hughes settings, and it's just going to be really wonderful variety of stuff. Yeah, that's great. Some of those pieces are actually, I found, uh, quite haunting in a way. You know, some of the uh, pieces I, I, I caught um, a performance that you did with um, Catherine. I don't know where it was, but the background was like a brick fireplace or something like that, and some of those pieces mm-hmm. were, were were quite haunting. And I, the, the, the mixture of her voice and your uh, saxophone was... Um, you know, th- th- there's a lot of music out there that for, for what you do that is ca- capable of that uh, feeling because of the kind of instrument the saxophone is and can be. The saxophone is um, it's a real like a uh, mocking jay of 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 instruments. You can imitate a lot of different sounds, and and in that respect, it's it's akin to both like. Um, the human voice because there are so many colors and so many shapes and so many gestures and textures that you can make with the saxophone. And I think kind of the next closest comparison I can make is like electric guitar, honestly, because you, you you have so much like expressive bending potential and uh, so much potential to, to manipulate the sound into like humanistic unorthodox like uh, uh, tone uh, tone production, mm-hmm. I guess. But like, but it's in that it's in that in betweenism that the that the saxophone I think really becomes uh, a a real voice and and palette that that I like working. Now, Allison, yeah. I'm going to ask you uh, a, a little question, perhaps as an outsider, um, just looking at how they play. Um, Because I think you Mm -hmm. kind of alluded to it. Their technical proficiency is really kind of fascinating. Uh, You know, as I'm watching their fingers move across the uh, various valves and stops. um, What do you see in that technical proficiency when you hear them play and watch them play and accompany them that you find so inspiring? Well, you know, I really enjoyed just what Jake was talking about in terms of um, the palette of colors, because especially when he does collaborate with Catherine, um, it's really fascinating all the levels of timbre that that you can play with and that you can try to find to blend with whatever the other instrument is. And I don't know everything about how you do it, because sometimes it is in how you sort of manipulate the keys this, and sometimes it's at the embouchure level i think fundamentally the saxophone should be played um as a singer would sing we think about vowels we think about how we're holding our embouchure we think about how we're supporting with our breath and i think the saxophone is at the height of its beauty when it's it's the most absent the closer you can the closer you can not um not be caught up in the tool that is the saxophone and just get to to a sort of vocalized uh tone production then the the better the better it is the that more was, invisible yeah. it is the better it is that's nice and then watching just when he and sarah are working like for example with the brahms trio um there's really such intent on blending their sound but tuning all of those things really recognizing the overtones that happen in different composers Mm -hmm. too you know so so it's just all sorts of understanding of style as well as their own instruments Mm -hmm. um that's really just multi-leveled and uh 
if you are familiar with the Brahms horn trio, the technical feat that is the second movement in the piano. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, so I would play that saxophone part any day, like over. <laughs> like, I mean, we're 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 lucky to have the opportunity to present it because it's it's simply not something that every pianist would be willing to take on or or or, or do so beautifully. So thank you. I'm yeah, gonna go practice it's a after this. Well, that, <laughs> it'll be it'll be a treat to present it with. Oh, Allison. that's gonna be that sounds gonna be like a lot of. Fun. All right, listen, you two. Thank you very much for your time. I I, I so appreciate you coming on. And uh, we're going to really uh, be looking forward to your presentation at the Opera House on Friday, September 15th, starting at 7.30 p.m. And I, I think it's going to be a wonderful way to kick off the uh, Fredonia Opera House's fall season of entertainment. Sounds, sounds like a great time. Thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. If you haven't got your tickets to hear the Deco Ensemble perform at the Opera House, you need to get on that quickly, as their concert is coming up on Friday, September 15th, at 7.30 p.m. Tickets are $15 for adults, $13 for Opera House members, and $5 for students. Tickets are available at the Opera House box office at 716-679-1891 or online at www.fredopera.org. Here is the arts calendar for the next few weeks. The cinema series is already up and running with two movies in the coming two weeks. The mockumentary Theater Camp, about a group of theater kids who stage a show to save their beloved summer theater camp, screens on Saturday, September 16th and Tuesday, September 19th. Also, the summer blockbuster Oppenheimer, which probably needs no introduction at this point, will screen on Saturday, September 23rd and Tuesday, September 26th. All screenings begin at 7.30 p.m., and tickets are available at the door only. Cost is $7 for adults, six fifty for members, and $5 for students. The Marion Art Gallery at the Rockefeller Art Center at SUNY Fredonia has opened its first art exhibit of the season. Not Gay, an exhibit curated by noted queer art historian Jonathan D. Katz, charts the energy and vitality of trans identifications across a range of artworks from the immediate post-World War II period through the present day. The exhibit will be on display until November 12th. See the Marion Art Gallery website for more details. The Can-Am Trio, an all-female woodwind trio, will perform in the Rausch Recital Hall on Friday, September 15th at 8 p.m. Admission is free. The Rockefeller Arts Center's first pop series event features Fleetwood Mask, a Fleetwood Mac tribute show. The show will be performed in the King Concert Hall on Saturday, September 19th at 7.30 p.m. Tickets can be purchased at the campus box office by calling 716-673-3501 or online at www.fredonia.edu backslash tickets. The Western New York Chamber Orchestra, under the baton of Maestro Glenn Cortesi, will be performing Vivaldi's Gloria with the Fredonia Chamber Choir on Sunday, September 24th at 3 p.m. in the King Concert Hall. The Fredonia Jazz Showcase will perform on Wednesday, September 27th at 8 p.m. in Rausch Recital Hall, and the Fredonia Concert Band will follow them on Thursday, September 28th at 8 p.m. Admission is free for both events. Finally, Main Street Studios will be presenting a remount of the SUNY Fredonia Theater and Dance Spring 2023 production of Romeo and Juliet at the Frank Lloyd Wright Greycliff Estate, located in Derby, New York. This is a special one-day production on the beautiful estate of renowned architect Frank Lloyd Wright named Greycliff and sits on the shore of Lake Erie in Derby. The performance will begin at 2 p.m. on Saturday, September 23rd, and make use of the house as a theatrical environment. More information, including ticket prices, can be found at experiencegraycliff.org. And remember, if you have an arts event coming up and would like to get it mentioned on the arts calendar, please send an email to operahouse at fredopera.org or call the box office at 716-679-1891 with your information. Sudden heat, hearts leaping again. 
In the early 2000s, a strong crop of female Broadway stars began to make their presence felt on the Great White Way. One of these talented performers was Eden Espinoza, who played the role of Elphaba in the musical Wicked on Broadway and the first national tour, as well as the role of Maureen Johnson in the closing cast of the musical Rent. She is taking one day off from rehearsals for her upcoming appearance in local boy Michael John Lacuse's latest musical, The Garden of Annuncia, opening at Lincoln Center on November 20th, to come to Fredonia, teach a master class, and give a solo concert on the Opera House stage. It was a great privilege to get the chance to speak with her and record this interview. Well, I have to say that if I could possibly have had my choice as to who to interview for the first podcast of the third season, um, getting someone like Eden Espinosa would be right up there on the top of the list. Broadway star, wonderful singer, uh, great personality, and she will be coming to the Opera House on uh, Friday, September 22nd at 7.30 p.m., and I suggest everybody get their tickets early. Eden Espinosa, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for being here. It's a, it's a great privilege to be able to talk to you and take up a little bit of your time. Um, now, uh, I ha- I'm bursting with questions, so I'll try to contain myself um, and ask uh, <laughs> o- only a few. But uh, we'll start off. I want to start off with your, obviously, your, your early career, how you got started in the business. I mean, Broadway is one hell of a place to try and break into. And yes. uh, like, like everybody else, I'm always interested in how performers managed to, to make that breakthrough. So could you give us a little bit of background about that, how you, how you got to um, that, pace, that place? Sure. Um, I grew up in Southern California in Orange County, and I pretty much did everything that I could do without becoming a member of Actors' Equity. Um, you know, I did, I worked at Disneyland, I worked at Universal Studios, I did um, industrial work, studio sessions, um, regional theater. And um, I had been auditioning for Broadway shows and tours for quite some time and getting very, very close to the end, if you will. And um, a casting director kept bringing me in and he called me one day and told me about a new musical that was having a workshop and they were looking for their lead and they had seen people in New York and haven't quite found what they were looking for and so they were coming to LA and that was for the musical Brooklyn that I originated years and years ago and that's what took me to New York. That's interesting because most people would probably uh, uh, um, think about you as as getting into the cast of Wicked and then doing Brooklyn which came afterwards so that's like I didn't realize that it was uh, the reverse. (laughs) Yes yes I had been involved with Brooklyn um years before I had ever been cast in Wicked. So my, my, and that actually um, played a part in my role in Wicked because when I went in for the audition, um, they had already had their out of town tryout in San Francisco. And Stephanie J. Block actually was in the ensemble of Wicked, she had originated the role of Elphaba years and years before. And, you know, things always go kind of crazy in our industry. <laughs> we have a, a, a roundabout way of getting to the end sometimes. But she was cast in Boy From Oz. And she called me and said, you know, I'm not going to be a part of the cast anymore, but they're going to be looking for um, an understudy or a standby for Elphaba. And you should tell your agent to go in. And so I went in and auditioned and they gave me the option. Do you want to be in the ensemble and be the understudy or do you want to be the standby? Which the standby um, does not perform in the show every night. You just sit and wait. And if somebody's, <laughs> if, if Elphaba gets sick or if she goes on vacation or any of that, then you're the first to go on basically. And I knew that... Brooklyn was coming down the pike. I knew it was coming to Broadway. It was just a matter of when. And I sort of wanted that to be my first, you know, performing every night role. So I chose the standby and um, mainly for the purpose that I wouldn't be performing every night. And I wanted Brooklyn to be my first, (laughs) um, you know, 
not real role, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, your um, first, uh huh, your first lead, your first appearance. Uh, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. And so it just like came, happened that when I would go on for Alphabet, and this was like right at the beginning of social media, YouTube had just become a thing, chat rooms had just, message boards had just become a thing. And, um, when I would, when I would go on, people started talking and that's sort of how my fan base started growing. And they came over to Brooklyn when I left Wicked to go to Brooklyn. And so it was, um, serendipitous how it all, how it all came to fruition. Now, uh, let me ask you just a little bit about, uh, uh playing Elphaba. You, you played her on Broadway. You played her in San Francisco. You played that part, um, on the Hearst National Tour. You played that part quite a lot. Uh, uh, what is it about that part that you think makes it so, so interesting to play, to keep on playing, to keep on wanting to play? Yeah. Um, I think the humanity of the character that we, our job is to show the audience. You know, it's a character that, most people don't want to investigate or know about because of the Wizard of Oz. You know, she's the villain. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, the opportunity to, to continue coming back to it was that I, I had more to learn um, from, from playing the role. And, you know, playing Elphaba always gave me a mirror inside my soul to, to, learn things about myself and as I was maturing like I played that role from the ages 25 to 32 which are pretty formative years for um you know getting to know yourself as a woman as an artist as an adult a fully grown adult you know mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> so um so yeah that's the reason why I kept going back and then that's the reason why I ultimately stopped because I was like I think um I think I'm I'm done learning from this particular person and role and I have more things to expand upon. And you also got to play the, the role of Maureen Johnson in Rent, uh, another big name, uh, you know, major musical of the era. What was, uh, what was that like a little bit to take on that one? Oh my gosh. Well, Rent, it was, I, I was always been a fan of musical theater. Um, you know, growing up in Southern California, you don't have access to it as much as you do here in New York, but, um, it was something that I always loved and wanted to do, but I, I wasn't, you know, when I was growing up, people didn't have like musical theater intensives and college programs as much as they do now. So I just went, sang along to the radio and records and was, was in children's theater groups and stuff. But, um, my voice was more pop, mm -hmm. I would say. And when Rent came out, was the first musical that I listened to that I was like, Oh, I don't have to like alter my style that much. Mm -hmm. And, um, I fell in love with it and I set my sights as like, Oh, Maureen, I want to play that part. And it was the first Broadway show on Broadway that I saw my best friend in high school. And I took a trip our senior year with our moms and got tickets from a scalper because it was, it was the year that it was first year was open. It was my senior year in high school. It was like impossible to get tickets. Um, and so it was a role I always wanted to do. And I had auditioned for it over and over again over the years and never quite make, got it until the closing cast. Um, and our producers, um, our, pro our producers from Wicked had, collaborated and produced Next to Normal and Michael Greif directed that and Michael Greif asked our producers about their experience about working with me and, and what they thought about you know uh, me being in the closing cast and playing Maureen and I'm so grateful they had good things to say <laughs> <laughs> and it was like one of the first major jobs that I was just offered and they it was an offer to come in for that summer and and close the the, the cast and we filmed it for movie theater so it's forever it's forever archived which is beautiful and it was an, an amazing full circle moment for me actually the um opening night of Wicked, and this is before I had a digital camera, so this dates us. <laughs> uh, I uh, took a picture on a disposable camera of me, Adina, and Tay, and I, I, I told Tay Diggs, I said, 
who was her husband at the time, I said, um, I have this picture of the three of us from when I saw Rent, and I want to take a picture of us tonight and put us side by side for Adina, just to show her like she's always I've always looked up to her, and mm -hmm. so that was a present that I gave her a side by side picture of the three of us in 1996 and the three of us in 2003. Wow. So it was a it was very meaningful. Playing both of those roles were very meaningful for me. Um, so that's a little a little rent story. That's nice. That's a, that's a great one, boy. Uh, <laughs> a, a pic pictures the three of you, and of course, I, I I have seen the film, so I saw you perform, and that's a whole nother, yeah. That's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm interested. In the fact you you know you mentioned that you know you always thought you had a pop sound to your voice a, a minute ago, and now you're doing solo albums and taking that opportunity to to sort of transition yourself over to creating albums. You have, I believe, two of them out now. Now, um, is that correct? That's correct. Talk, talk, a, talk a little bit about that transition, how you're making the transition to um, um, being a, a solo pop artist. Um, well, my first album is is modern Broadway songs, but we took them out of context and, and made arrangements as if you would hear them on the radio, mm -hmm. um, which was a really cool project um, to reimagine these songs and, and to look at them as standalone um, you know, tunes. And then that led me to writing. I hadn't, I had written songs just for fun when I was little. Um, and then I think over time I sort of got too heady about it and was judging things too soon and wouldn't, oh, this is, this isn't good. And then I wouldn't finish something. Um, and then I was just in a time in my life where I needed to process a lot that was happening for me and um so I just started writing out my feelings and thoughts in journals and um I had come across a producer that I wanted to work with for my second album which was always supposed to be just like the first mm -hmm. modern Broadway songs that we take out of context and he said to me you know I've only been talking to you for this person was not involved in theater at all so mm -hmm. He's like, I've only been talking to you for like a little bit, but have you tried writing? Like, I think you have so much to say and such an interesting perspective. And I'd like, for me, I want to hear some of your stories and how some of your thoughts and feelings. And I said, well, I have a lot written down, but they weren't intended to be songs. And he's like, why don't we try it? And so that's what we did. And so my second album revelation is is all all my journal entries <laughs> well i have to say if if i may say i i saw a couple of them i believe on youtube when i was doing my research on you and um they uh for me anyway just uh, uh, it was a whole different eden espinosa than i had really come to know through you mm. know my knowledge of broadway and your your particular uh, uh, biography and history there and i went mm. wow that is uh, it, it, there are some stunning tunes there i hope you're going to do some thank at the you. opera house thank you it's it's interesting as i you know have um continued to do concerts over the year it's it's hard to really and this is i've had several friends who i've colleagues who I've known from musical theater who started doing their own music and had to step away to really like step away from musical theater to really focus on on the music side and I understood a little bit why they did that because certain venues or certain audiences they really only want to hear the Broadway stuff and don't want to hear the original stuff and, and not in a negative way but they know you from this, you know, so it's hard to sometimes meld the two, but um, there are certain ones that I put in a, into the Broadway set as well. So we'll see. Um, so speaking of different and unique, um, you're going to be working once again with uh, Michael John Lacusa. And if yes. there and if there is a more unique musical theater composer in the world of musical theater today, I don't know who that is. He is an iconoclast of the first uh, first degree and and an amazing composer who continually yes. goes unrecognized by Broadway. And you're going out okay. to you're going out to um, the Old Globe, I believe, in San Diego to work with him on a new musical based on the life of the choreographer Danielle Graciela. 
Um, yes. And you did something with him earlier before. Can you speak to me a little bit about uh, his work and what attracts you to his work? Because he's, yeah. he's, he's amazing. Yeah. Well, the exciting thing about this is we did our, we did do the production at the old globe in 2021. Mm -hmm. Um, and now we are heading to Lincoln center in New York, which Uh is so exciting because Michael John's work, it's been, it's been a number of years since he's had a show here in New York. Um, well, honestly, what drew me to him was the audition. (laughs) I got called in for um, a musical that he wrote um, called Rain, which was Mm -hmm. based on the Somerset mom story. And it was, you know, it was the first time that I had worked in quite a number of years, actually. Like I had, I took a step away. I I took an acting program here in the city and then I, um, did the album, my first album, and then I was doing concerts. So I hadn't really done a theater job in a while. And I booked this job and I went to San Diego and I just fell in love with his work um, and the way that he writes humans, in particular women. Um, there are sometimes, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but there have been times where I've played a character written by a man that has a very, it's like you can't really get into actually the female experience, but Michael John has this way of writing women that is just so delicious and nuanced and rich. And this particular story, it's an honor um, to portray these women who raised Grazi and made her who she is today and on the path that she she has taken throughout her life and her and michael john are very very close and have collaborated on this for years so we are thrilled to take it to new york and to have new york audiences who know and love grazi just have a little bit more insight into her upbringing and um these these women who raised her her mom her her aunt and her grandmother yeah, and when is that opening so people know? Uh, we are opening in November. I am the worst person to not know the exact date, but our previews <laughs> <laughs> our previews start in October. I want to say in the teens somewhere, and then we open November. I want to say twentieth. Um, uh, Gardens of Anuncia gave me the time off to co- still come and do the concert. They were gracious enough and. The team at the Opera House is gracious enough to work around the schedule, so we're still going to make it happen. I'm still going to teach right. the class and do the concert all in one day, and it's going to be amazing. Well, Eden, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. It was an absolute pleasure to talk to you uh, and, and uh, listen to your stories. And I wish you, the, you. I wish you the best of luck with um, uh, the uh, uh, performance of Garden of Anuncia coming. with, uh, with my, uh, Did you know Michael John, by the way, was uh, born and raised here about 20 miles from here? I didn't know that. Yes, he oh my was. Oh, God. Uh-huh. I love it. That's, I think that's one of the reasons why I know about Michael John more than most people do because okay. he's from the areas. But it's a lot of fun talking to you. Man, I appreciate it. And, thank uh, you so much. Thank you once again. I, uh, I, good luck with the concert. Hope to see you there. Hope you get a great crowd. Yes. Thank you so much. See you soon. Eden Espinosa will be performing live at the 1891 Opera House on Friday, September 22nd, beginning at 7.30 p.m. Tickets are $25 for adults, $23 for members, and $10 for students. Also, Ms. Espinosa will be teaching a master class from 2 to 4 p.m. that same Friday at the Rausch Recital Hall on the SUNY Fredonia campus. The master class is free and open to the public. Don't miss your chance to hear this stunning talent live and in concert. Walk around, the world's a lovely sight, lovely sky and sea. Well, it used to be Look around The world is shining bright Watch the green grass grow Well, that one
And that's it for this Here We Go Again edition of Notes from the Isle Seat. My thanks to Rick Davis, Jacob Swanson, Alison D'Amato, and Eden Espinosa for being my guests on this episode. Notes from the Isle Seat is a production of the 1891 Fredonia Opera House in Fredonia, New York. For more information on any of the Opera House's events, call the box office at 716-679-1891, visit the website at www.fredopera.org, or email at operahouse at fredopera.org. Notes from the Isle Seat is available wherever you get your podcasts and also on the Opera House YouTube channel. If you like this podcast, please consider following us by clicking the follow button on our home website at isleseat.podbean.com and spreading the word through your social media feeds. If you have an arts event you'd like featured on the podcast, why don't you drop us a line at operahouse at fredopera.org and we'll see about featuring your event. Please try to give us a month's advance notice if possible to facilitate timely scheduling. If you have any suggestions, comments, or criticisms of the podcast, just drop us a line at operahouse at fredopera.org. We'll be glad to receive your feedback. Our next episode will be available on September 27th, 2023. I'm Tom Lachlan, and until then, be safe out there and be kind to one another. <laughs>